Thank you very much for joining us this March afternoon. This is the first of the webinars that we've done here at Albert Hughes Sharp with our partners. And I think this is going to be the first of many. So very warm welcome to everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is James Crocker. I'm a partner here at Albert Hughes Sharp and I oversee the running of the Model Portfolio Service. I've been with the firm here since 2012. And we're going to try and keep it short and sweet as best we can this afternoon, conscious that time is at a premium for everyone. I will kick off with a bit of a background on Albert Hughes Sharp, a brief overview of the Model Portfolio Service, and try and demonstrate what it is that we do differently here at Albert Hughes Sharp, uh, and that has really helped us deliver some amazing returns over the last year, but over the last five years and beyond for that matter. One aspect is what we call our quality first approach to investing in equities. And one of the aims is today is to demonstrate how well it fits with the approach that Pollen Capital take and why the focus growth fund uh, features across our portfolio suite. Paul Williams, the head of international business development over at Pollen, uh, will give us uh, an introduction to the firm there. Uh, but the star of the show really today, I guess, is Brian Power, who is an analyst, a research analyst on the US Growth Fund. He's going to go through their approach and talk about the performance. Uh, and we are very grateful to have Brian with us this afternoon. If you have any questions along the way, bearing in mind this is a webinar, it's not a regular Zoom type meeting. Hopefully you will see somewhere on your screen, either at the top probably, or maybe at the bottom, a Q&A button. Feel free to press that, ask away any questions that you'll have. We'll be picking them up here and we will do our best to answer them as we go through. So really with no further ado, let me get on with, with Albert T. Sharp and a quick overview of what we do here based in Stratford-upon-Avon. Now, I think a lot of the people out there are well familiar with, with what we do, but uh, just to let you know, we're rapidly approaching 600 million uh, sterling under management. We've got 10 experienced partners who are also uh, investment managers. Um, and But the most important thing, if you weren't aware of that, of this is that we are purely discretionary fund managers. Uh, we have no advisor arm, we are purely independent. Uh, it's a really important point this, because I think it's one of, we're one of the few companies that can truly say uh, that our interests are completely aligned with the advisors that we work with and also their clients as well. Uh, when it comes to security selection or business planning, we're completely unfettered and encumbered by outside influences that could possibly cloud our, our judgment. And I think there are generally very few DFMs that can actually say that uh, these days. Just moving on, uh, the model portfolio service itself, a lot of you are going to be familiar with this, but in short, it's 10 risk-based multi-asset portfolios. Uh, we have them available in-house where we arrange the custody. They're also available uh, across all of the major platforms. Um, and as you probably know, they're ideal for tax-free planning, uh, tax-free portfolios, uh, but also can be suitable for uh, lots of other reasons as well over on top of that. Over the last five years, the performance is there. This is actually after our costs. Suffice to say that it runs in a nice line in terms of risk leading to higher levels of reward. De facto have given us a badge from three to seven, given us that third party validation. These guys measure the risk that we have in the portfolio. Um, and suffice to say, they've given us the full five stars and uh, five diamonds for our model portfolio service as well. The team itself is, is critical to really what drives the, the, the portfolios, what pro really drives the performance at the end of the day. Uh, we've got a, a great blend of youth and experience. Um, I think one of the key things though that maybe differentiates us here is that a lot of our background and certainly mine has been on the sell side as a, as a broker uh, in previous years, uh, then moving on to the uh, buy side, physically running money. And I think my point here is that if you are going to be a fund picker, a uh, fund selector these days, it, it, not so much these days, uh, it really helps if you physically run money yourself in the past. To so understand the hopes and fears, the pitfalls and everything that goes along with running money um, is, is the best kind of experience, I would argue. But I think one thing that differentiates us, maybe to a degree, is that Alistair and I spend a lot of time looking under the bonnet of what is under the portfolios. We are fascinated by the security selection. And what that leads to and what it stems and it dovetails with 
is, a, is an inherent belief. The central tenet of our philosophy is that financial markets are inefficient. Inefficient markets imply that essentially there is scope for outperformance. Active management, therefore, is the solution, not passive trackers by definition. Now, that's easier said than done, I appreciate, but it is our central job to find the managers. They are out there. It is just a matter of finding them, but knowing how to find them, knowing how to ask the right questions um, and how to do your sourcing is, is really where the, where the skill, I would argue, uh, comes into it. Do not get sidetracked by the unknowable things out there, the macroeconomic noise, for example. Don't get dragged into conversations about predicting the future too much. Know what is knowable. That's our mantra. That's very much the, uh, the central uh, belief that, that we have, that there is no point getting drawn into speculating about what is going to happen in the future. Now, you need to be organized. You need to have a framework. Uh, we certainly have a very clear criteria for what it is we're looking for to a manager um, and the quality first approach that we have. And I think you're going to hear more of that really in, with what, what Brian has to say later. You'll see how, how we approach equities. Um, uh, it's, it's very important that we find the same right fund manager who has the same type of belief. The point is, take a different approach. You'll get a different type of performance. And of course, a different type of performance, what we're looking for here is superior performance of course. Now, the quality first element of the, of the equity analysis here is, is hardly reinventing the wheel. None of this is going to be particularly new to anyone. A lot of this is going to, it comes right from the, the Warren Buffett playbook in many ways. But we want to see companies in our portfolios that have got an enduring competitive advantage. We want to see companies that have got an addressable market that is growing. We want to see a uh, companies that have clearly got first-class management. That's important in the sense that what we've not mentioned there is valuation. Valuation is important. It's not irrelevant, but we think seeking quality first and valuation second is the way to approach this. It goes in hand in hand by saying that by picking the right companies, part of the, part of the objective here is to avoid the bad ones. A statement of the obvious it probably sounds like, but it is amazing how many companies uh, people arguably gamble on that are in turnaround situations, distress situations, that they are not areas that we, we delve in. We find it too risky uh, and we really find that um, this is not the source of, of, of alpha ultimately that, that we're talking to. We're looking for a degree of certainty as much as those that can be achieved. Um, and in order to do that, avoid certain companies uh, that basically have, have red flags. And moving on from that, the management here is, is critical. A lot of the guys that you're going to see on the left-hand side of the screen, I hope this is, this is clear. I realise it's quite busy. On some screens, it, it's, it's not going to be that clear. Uh, the slides will be available after this. But suffice to say, the guys that you can see on the left here, a lot of you are going to be familiar with. They have very, very common traits, common themes. These are, these are conviction investors. These are guys who are not interested in the benchmark. These are the guys who look at a share of a company rather than shares in a company. And these are, these are, a lot of these have got a calling in terms of what they do in the sense that this isn't just a job to them. Uh, this is this is something that they are going to do, even if they win the Euro Millions lottery next week. Uh, they're still going to be doing their job, we think. Uh, now, I'm noticeably absent, of course, on there is the Poland Capital guys. Well, I've, I've deliberately left that clear here because I think Brian is going to is going to fill in that last that last picture himself as the afternoon goes on. Ultimately, where we're we going with all of this is the performance. This is clearly what we want to deliver to our clients because this is what we think our clients want to see first and foremost. 2020 was a great year for us. Here you can see the ARC equity risk. These are the benchmarks that we use at the top end, seven, eight, and 10. Our portfolios there that are predominantly equity based. Uh, brought in between 19 and 25% last year. That compares to the average portfolio of just over 5%. Similarly, as you go down there, you can see our bars compared to the black bars are significantly ahead of the benchmark. Now, 2020 was a particularly good year for us, but it's no, um, no flash in the pan. Push this out five years, 
and you can see those numbers, I would argue, speak for themselves. And that is really simply a function of following a framework that we've built over a number of years, following the quality first approach, making sure we are invested with the right managers, sticking to our knitting, not being distracted by maybe value traps or value stories uh, or, or basically uh, distracting um, pictures from, uh, uh, from stories that don't dovetail with how we look at the world. Now, each quarter, I spend an enormous amount of time going through our performance numbers and comparing it to other DFMs in our, in our peer group. Now, I appreciate this is a busy slide. There's a lot going on here. But hopefully what you can see is that the, the red circles here highlight the Albert E. Sharp portfolios as you go up the risk scale uh, from one to ten. And it's noticeable there. This is over one year. We are significantly well ahead of nearly the entire peer group over the entire uh, over the entire period. Again, no flash in a pan there because we've done the same over five years as well. Um, and anybody who wants to see the names behind the dots here, please get in touch. Happy to share our analysis with you. Uh, also happy to hear your thoughts on on performance and the right the right way to analyze it as well. It takes up a lot of my time, but I think the point is here. I can't properly know what it is that we do differently if I unless I understand what our peer group do differently. And I think the one thing that is clear is that our performance is clearly because we do something different. That different approach equals superior performance. Therefore, again, this this ability to block out the noise not get drawn into what is what is irrelevant and to know what is knowable is so crucial in getting the right portfolios together. Of course, the, we have to continue to believe that markets are inefficient uh, and we continue to find the managers that can outperform for the long term. Getting drawn into volatility equals um, risk equals standard deviation uh, is, is not our way of looking at risk. Our, our focus on risk is permanent loss of capital. Do not get drawn into a situation where you might lose 100% of your holding. Uh, and really, the quality first approach, I have to say, speaks for itself. It must do in the performance that we've seen over five years. In fact, it, and the other thing to press here, it goes on well beyond five years. Uh, it really goes all the way back to the 10 years almost you know, since we've been running these portfolios. And the very final point I would just make is that we have a desire to win that league, to come first in the performance league tables across our, our peer group. Uh, the only thing I would say is that I think we're about the only discretionary fund manager out there who is actually prepared to say that. Um, but I will leave it for you guys to be the judge of that. If anybody's got any questions uh, after, after the uh, the webinar, please get in touch and I'll be happy to break down those numbers and get into more detail. So at that point, I feel as though I've rattled on long enough already. I'm going to pass over now to Paul Williams, the International Business Development Manager from Poland, who will give you a little bit of background on uh, Poland themselves and then on to Brian. Uh, so with that, any questions uh, that you have right now, feel free to press the Q&A button and I'll be able to pick them up and hopefully after Brian's finished um, with his presentation uh, we can pick up any Q&A at the end. But with that, uh, Paul, thanks a lot. Over to you. Thank you, James. Let me just uh, share my screen if that's okay with you. I think you may need to stop sharing for a second. Thank you. Perfect. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see that. And I guess a, a formal thank you, James, for inviting us on to speak. We, you know, we truly appreciate the partnership with you and and we also certainly want to acknowledge everybody at Poland for everybody taking their time to join us this afternoon. So as James said my name is Paul Williams and I am responsible for our international business. I'm based in London and I'm also delighted to be joined by Brian, Brian Power, who is a member of the investment team at our headquarters and has been with us for, for over five years now. Uh, he is based in a much warmer Florida right now. So maybe just a few words of introduction and then as James said, I'll hand over to Brian and he'll walk you through the kind of how we do what we do. So um, I joined Poland around 18 months ago to establish the London office. So it's an office that hasn't been around for, for too long. Um, we actually only spent three days in the office before lockdown struck. So we're actually looking forward to, to getting back in there. Um, but the London office is really there to build and serve our international clients. In terms of history of the organization, Poland was established over 40 years ago by a gentleman called David Poland. It's where the name comes from. 
he was a New York stockbroker who wanted to escape that life and establish a wealth management business. But he felt he wanted to do that and run money in a very, very specific way, very much along the lines that James has, has spoken about how Albert E. Sharp views the financial world. Um, but he wants to do that with an independence of thought. So in the early 80s, he was experimenting in managing concentrated portfolios of only the best companies he could find and also relocating down to Florida. So back then, I guess you could say he was groundbreaking in developing this idea of portfolio concentration. By the late 80s, he had formulated a very distinctive investment process, which remains in operation today. And the way in which we went to, we go about finding the most competitively positioned and financially superior companies has now been unchanged, working on behalf of our clients for well over three decades. Today, sadly, David is no longer with us, but we have all become stewards of his investment beliefs and have grown into a $60 billion employee-owned investment boutique with around 100 people operating from three office locations. We offer seven equity investment strategies across the capitalization spectrum in different geographies in both developed and emerging economies. But regardless of the portfolio the clients invest in, they have enjoyed returns that have been significantly higher than the benchmark with much less volatility. So at this point, it does make sense to hand over to Brian to explain how we actually do that. And I think he's gonna start by introducing the team. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, and thank you everybody for your time. We really appreciate it on behalf of myself and Poland. Um, <clears throat> so this is our team. We have an 11 member team. It's a, uh, um, you know, we're based in sunny Boca Raton. As Paul mentioned, we're away from the noise of the financial centers. It really helps us uh, think. There's a reason why Warren Buffett's in Omaha, Nebraska, as I say, as opposed to New York. Um, <clears throat> so we're all, uh, so the two portfolio managers of our focus growth, our U.S. focus growth strategy are Brandon Ladoff in kind of the eight o'clock timeframe and also Dan Davidowitz around four o'clock on the wheel. But uh, it's important to note that we're all generalists, we're all analysts, it's very flat, it's very collegial, um, and this, this kind of allows us to analyze businesses on an absolute basis rather than relative, and every, there's no experts in the room, but um, it's a very team-based team, team-based team environment, I should say. And then we could jump to page 11. This is our philosophy, so this is probably the most important slide that I'll touch on. Uh, and you'll see a lot of common themes to, as to what James was talking about previously with quality first. But um, before we get into the actual slide here uh, in detail, I want to tell you a bit about Poland and how we got here. So our focus growth strategy has compounded at about 15 percent annually for over 30 years uh, by taking while taking less risk. Uh, and we've achieved this by strictly adhering to a philosophy and process that remains unchanged since 1989. The overarching goal of this philosophy has always been to be long-term owners of a concentrated portfolio of high quality, competitively advantaged businesses that in total can grow earnings per share at about 15% or higher. And we firmly believe that if we buy these great businesses at a fair price, then over the long term, and time is an essential component of this, the stock prices will follow the earnings growth of these businesses. And this slide kind of helps us unpack this uh, overarching goal. In the top left, we have concentrated portfolio. So uh, our focus growth strategy seeks to own roughly 20 companies because we only want to own the highest quality businesses. And when we find them, we want to own enough of each to, make, to actually make it count. And this term high quality is not a soft or fuzzy or nebulous term to us. Uh, I know it's a buzzword in the industry now, but it, we've always used the same five guardrails that are concrete measures of quality. And you can see it in the second bullet point. So strong balance sheets, abundant free cash flow, strong returns on equity over 20%. That's two to three times the average business, extremely profitable, stable to improving margins and real organic revenue growth. And the important thing is when you combine these five guardrails, we wipe out almost 90% of our entire universe right off the bat that of above average or even average or below average businesses that are just not up to snuff. 
this uh, this leaves roughly uh, 10% of the universe, and it's really a stocked pond, and we spend all of our time fishing in that pond. Then in the bottom left, we have this long holding compounding period and the idea of time arbitrage. We think and act like private business owners. And this is critically important because you simply have to hold these businesses for the long term in order for the power of compounding to work. Despite this basic truth, the average fund manager's uh, holding period is now under six months. Uh, and, and that means they're turning over their entire portfolio which is typically hundreds of securities inside of a year. Uh, it, to show you how different we are than that, our average holding period is over five years, and we've actually only owned um, just over 125 different companies in total in our, in our over 30 year history, which is fairly remarkable in the industry. In the top right, we have risk management. I could break this up into two parts. So the first part is our margin of safety. Our margin of safety is rooted in the quality of the select few businesses that we own. By limiting our holdings to roughly 20 and using those guardrails I mentioned to wipe out 90% of the universe right off the bat, we really limit risk to a great degree at the beginning of the process. And then the second part is our don't lose mentality as it notes here. Uh, and this, this is really our, our firms and our team's relentless focus on preservation of capital. You can see it in our mission statement, which has the words preserve before grow very intentionally. You can see it in our balance sheet, strong balance sheets guardrail, and also how we construct the portfolio, which I'll touch on in a second. We know from our long history, you just simply don't get extra points for difficulty. This is not Olympic figure skating. In the bottom right, we have uh, outcome orientation, weighing machine versus voting machine. So in the short term, the market's a sentiment and psychology driven voting machine. But in the long term, it's an earnings growth driven weighing machine. And that's where we play. Uh, and and I think, in my opinion, the humility, discipline and long term thinking that are ingrained in our firm's culture are critical behavioral advantages. We don't make macro calls. We stay fully invested at all times and we sell unemotionally when we can't get comfortable with a new risk. And lastly, what we're seeking to provide clients is double digit returns with lower levels of risk. And if you just take a step back and summarize this whole page and the philosophy, all it is is really, we try to find 20 of the best companies domiciled in the US, 20 of the most high quality and competitively advantaged ones, own them for a very long time, treat them like a true business and let these, hard, let these great businesses do the hard work for us. And then we'll, we could jump to, uh, Page 12, to touch on our process really quickly. So we could use this mountain to depict our, our process, how we actually pick the stocks. Uh, it's actually not drawn to scale. I take issue with this every time I see this slide, but the bottom of the mountain should be about 10 times the size because when I, as I mentioned, when you run our universe through our guardrails, um, almost 90% are wiped off right off the bat. So it should be a massive narrowing up the mountain. So it's, at, but then at step two, we go from 3,000 companies down to about 350. And this is where we do our initial research project. We um, test whether something is overly, uh, it, whether it's fin financials and that it met our guardrails is actually sustainable. And that comes down to really the moat, but also ruling out anything that's overly cyclical, fad or fashion driven. So you can think of Ugg boots or Crocs, uh, no offense if you're wearing them right now, uh, and any cyclicals in terms of oil and gas, banks, materials, telecom, utilities. These are things we're not against owning. They just have never really passed our bar for cyclicality. Um, and that's, that's that. One step uh, further, this is step three. We, this is basically 100 to 150 companies. This is our universe. This is that stocked pond I was talking about. And we spend the vast majority of our time in this step doing iterative deep dive research, assessing uh, the company's competitive advantages, how big the growth runway is, how um, it, whether the TAM is growing or not, management team, are they people we ch like, trust, and admire, um, you know, uh, various different industry competitive dynamics. And then at the end of the process, we basically ch pick the best 20. Uh, sorry, the uh, two portfolio managers, Dan and Brandon, pick the best 20. And then uh, on the next slide, on 13, actually, I want to touch on. Um, so in this royal blue at the bottom of this slide, 
you can see a flow chart of our process. And the important thing I want to point out is that there's multiple times when we have presentations and discussions. Typically, when we're researching a company, it could take anywhere from several months up to several years. Um, we, we typically have multiple people covering the company, digging in at one time, an analyst, maybe a PM, maybe multiple analysts at a time. Uh, but we have multiple presentations and discussions. We, it's a very team-based, uh, collaborative environment. We're not the type of firm where somebody holds themselves up in an office for several months at a time and comes out with the next best idea uh, and says, Eureka, I've got it. It's, it's a very collaborative from the start type of process. And then one other thing I want to touch on just before we open it up to Q&A, page 16 is this is uh so when I met this is something that I think really makes us unique in the industry and we we tend to get put in a style box of growth but I would echo what James said we're really quality first investors um, and if you when I talked about our portfolio trying to achieve 15% earnings per share growth over uh, as a portfolio this is a visual depiction of how we've we've always arrived at that 15% we're not shooting for every company to be at 15 we do. Uh, we typically find companies that are high growth companies on the right hand side. So you'll have an Adobe, Autodesk, ServiceNow. These are companies that are going to grow 20% or faster over the next five years, a, a good deal faster than 15%. That's really our offense. Those are our strikers trying to put the ball in the net, uh, put the points on the board. In the middle of the, the spectrum, we have kind of our secular growth growers, something like a Visa, MasterCard, uh, an Alphabet or Nike. These are kind of right around that mid-teens rate, solid, very competitively advantaged, high quality businesses with solid growth rates um, and tailwinds. And then on the left-hand side, this is really the unique chunk of the, of the spectrum. Uh, we have these blue companies, something like a Dollar General or Abbott Labs or even uh, Microsoft. These are durable growth businesses that are uh, probably won't grow 15%, definitely not for Dollar General and Abbott. They're probably closer to low double digits, um, but with inc maybe 11, 12, 13% earnings per share growth, but with incredible resiliency and durability through the cycle. And some of these businesses like Dollar General are even counter cyclical. Um, so this balance structure um, is really how um, we've been able to outperform, kind of hang in there in good times, uh, typically not outperforming in speculative up markets, but in downturns, um, we really outperform and protect capital. And that ties back to our, our firm's since inception. We've had first percentile downside capture. And you've seen this play out in both the tech bubble in the year 2000, as well as uh, 2008 and 2009, where the, uh, our portfolio's earnings were able to continue to compound at double digits rates, while uh, the index's earnings were down 30 and 40 percent. And you actually saw it last year, too, where we were able to protect capital very nicely. So that's it for my uh, prepared comments, but uh, we can open up to any Q&A anybody has. Well, I'll just, um, there's one, one question that, that Alistair and I have um, uh, that we found quite interesting over the last few weeks is, is the role of cryptocurrency. I don't know if Alistair might want to maybe elaborate on the question here, um, but to, to what degree is this impacting how you're analyzing the balance sheets or the activities or the, or the valuations? I'm, I'm thinking the likes of MasterCard, for example, and some of the headlines that we've seen uh, recently, I, I think can really blur a story uh, and can create speculative bubbles, um, but also make it really rather difficult to analyze, uh, you know, the, the actual growth factors or maybe the, the actual intrinsic value of a company. I just wondered, how's crypto, how's Bitcoin affecting you? And, and Alistair, do, you, do I need to elaborate on that any further? Have I? Yeah, I, I think the real question was, what might the reaction of the team be should a, in an unlikely event, a portfolio company decide to take a position in cryptocurrency? Or is that a slightly weird, weird question for you, Brian? No, no, it's surprisingly coming up a lot these days. Um, so we wouldn't take a position in cryptocurrency. It's, you know, we're looking for high quality businesses that you can, you know, 
pretty reasonably predict what the free cash flow they're going to generate over time is. We do pay attention to crypto as well as blockchain and things like that, more so from kind of a risk management area. It's it's one of those potential long tail threats to a Visa or MasterCard or maybe opportunities as well. Um, PayPal, it's one I cover PayPal. It's, it's clearly they're now enabling people to buy, hold and sell crypto in their wallets. And eventually they want to be able to use it uh, as a as a funding mechanism to buy things. So clearly there's a lot of excitement in the space. There's a lot of um, benefits to digital currency, especially potentially a, 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 a central bank issued digital currency, but um, we wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, purchase crypto ourselves because it's really not, you know, uh, know the, un- we don't try to know the unknowable in terms of whether it becomes the, it, it seems to have a very long way before it becomes a reserve currency because of the volatility for a number of reasons. Uh, this is one of those times it seems like some of the, you know, potential hype has gotten ahead of, the actual use cases. If you think about what makes Visa MasterCard special, besides the fact that 70% of the world's transactions are still cash and check, and that'll continue to move uh, towards digital uh, digital payments and most likely towards cards and things like Visa MasterCard, what makes them really special is being able to uh, process millions of transactions per second with unrivaled risk management and uh, the lowest levels of frauds rate, fraud rates you could actually imagine. Um, and in terms of doing it in an efficient, scaled manner, um, and then also handling things like returns and chargebacks for any kind of uh, returned payment, it's, uh, it's unparalleled. So we don't think it's a near-term threat or mid-term threat for either of their businesses. And there is actually some scenarios where they can actually kind of help enable uh Digital currency is becoming more of a reserve currency, but that's not for a number of years from now. So we're not super concerned with it, but it's something we're paying a lot of attention to because there is a lot of, um, you know, potential in the space. It's it's potential to remove even more fraud from the system and things like blockchain as well. But um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, cool. We have okay. we have a couple of other questions uh, out there, and I'm going to conflate two of them together because I think that they're on the same theme here from uh, from Philip and Daryl out there. And so, on one level, to to what? How do you how do you square? How do you answer the perception of a bubble in U.S. equities, uh, particularly some of the high profile tech names? And I would say maybe PayPal is the one that I get raised with me most often these days. I guess. Uh, and very related to that, with the tech holdings that you have in there, do you feel that the tech growth can be sustained? Is the rapid growth a worry? Two related questions, I think. There. Absolutely. So, it's it's a it's a very good question. Uh, it's one good to be it's good to be asking it right now because valuations have certainly come up in the. Um, in, in across the space. But uh, one thing I'll say on valuations to start, it, this is one of the luxuries that doesn't get speak, uh, spoken about often enough, in my opinion, to a concentrated portfolio. The fact that we only have to find 20 fairly priced businesses is a massive luxury at times like this, because at almost any given time, um, throughout history in all markets, you can find a very few, a very small number of businesses that are still fairly priced um, when you weigh the growth uh, potential and, and, the, and the actual price paid. Uh, but if I was, um, you know, our, our portfolio is almost as much as James, you had kind of touched on this earlier, but it's what we, it's as much what we do own as much as what we don't own. Exactly. Uh, you know, just not owning the 480 companies in the S&P 500 is, massively you're already way ahead of the competition because you're not owning a bunch of over levered poor businesses um but i wouldn't feel so i wouldn't feel great right now with where valuations are and the growth prospects if i had to fill a portfolio of 50 or even 100 or 200 companies in in a portfolio um we feel good about our our portfolio having fair prices and our ability to achieve achieve double digit returns from here and and specifically to paypal this is one that um, it's it, what happened with the crisis is suddenly not only were digital payments 
you know, potentially easier, more convenient, um, potentially, potentially um, less fraud involved. Uh, but it's now physically healthier to not handle cash. So uh, the, there's been a step function change in the slow S curve of adoption of digital payments. As I mentioned, 70 percent of the world's transactions are still cash and check. Um, and that has stepped up higher. And there's multiple tailwinds at PayPal's back. Also, at the same time, you have e-commerce and mobile commerce. E-commerce was something around the range of 15 to 20 percent. It's step function another five percentage points higher. And it's not going to turn back from here. Once people get that behavioral change where they start using e-commerce a little bit more, it's like, wow, this is actually pretty convenient. I, I can order my groceries online and I won't get a uh, you know, some wilted lettuce or a, or a bad potato or, a, you know, a squishy avocado. It's uh, you start to get these behavioral changes and then you're the the secular trends that we're investing behind become even more certain and are growing faster. And the companies that are involved in that, especially, you know, during this crisis, software businesses that were enabling digital transfer transformation, digital payments companies like PayPal enabling digital payments to happen when you can't actually see somebody in person during a lockdown. Um, these are things that have made their businesses even more mission critical. PayPal's, you can think of our software companies, Adobe, Autodesk, even more mission critical. And the tailwinds behind them have accelerated to go even faster because suddenly people realize they need these technologies to even operate, especially as a business, to survive, let alone thrive. Um, and for PayPal, so basically, there's a combination of two things. The growth behind them, the tailwinds and the adoption rate of digital payments has accelerated at the same time as the certainty uh, with which that has happened and, and whether the growth in the future will materialize has come to, has come even higher. So the uncertainty with uh, in relation to the business has come down and the growth has come up. So that's a good, and the business has gotten even stronger coming out of this crisis, which is a recurring theme across our portfolio. Um, and that those combination of things, you could see a valuation come up from there. And that's basically what we've seen. So that's not to say PayPal wasn't um, a little bit higher on the valuation side. We still feel comfortable about it. We have trimmed it recently as a source of cash for a couple of um, businesses we were trying to buy. Um, but it's still a, a phenomenal business, even more certainty to how good it's, its future, how bright its future looks, and its competitive advantages are stronger than ever right now. So um, we feel good about it, and, and um, we feel good about the portfolio in general. Cool. Now, I've got a couple of questions just hit me externally, uh, asking me about the longer-term performance of the fund. Now, I don't know what you have available to hand there that might be able to talk on that, the only thing is, or what I would say is that I do have a couple of slides uh, actually ready for this, just in case they were asked, talking about, and this goes back to, I've shown this to a lot of clients recently, um, and it is your slide that I happily pinched from you guys regarding the, uh, the earnings growth within the portfolio, dating all the way back to 1990, and versus the variability as for the, the S&P 500. Um, I guess the related question, so a couple of related questions is, can you talk about the long-term performance? Can you talk about the, the volatility of the, I think the one thing that's, that's slightly linked to this is there seems to be a concern that uh, focus and concentration runs the risk of volatility, whereas obviously we know the reality is that that's actually, although it might, it might be you know, intuitive that that could be the case, actually hasn't been the case. Um, I'm kind of waffling on a little bit here, but I don't know if you've got any of those longer term numbers, but if not, I can, I can share the screen with you because I did have this in my back pocket just in case this cropped up. Can I show you what I mean by that? Bear with me. Ooh, here you go. It's this slide here. I don't know, Brian, if you want to talk about this or even you want to talk about it, Paul, but actually, for what it's worth, I'm more than happy to go through this slide because this was one of the critical factors that actually led to us picking the, the fund in the first place. Do you want me to go through this? Because I can see there's a couple of, couple of questions. I, think, I don't think it's a very recent slide either. But one of the factors, oh, excuse me, let me go all the way to the bottom. 
in the appendix. Here you go. I don't know how clear this is, but this is one of the killer factors for us. Going all the way back, the portfolio, whether or not you've gone through growthy phases in the market, whether you've gone through uh, you know, tech bubbles, however you look at this, the consistency of earnings growth, these blue bars that you can see have been A, superior to the, the wider index, but, but B, far more consistent, far more reliable. And that is a complete function of buying the right stuff in the first place. The reality is, is that the, the portfolio has brought in 15.7% over the period against 7.2 for the S&P 500. Uh, okay, that I mean, that's all very well. You, you've bought into companies that have given you a higher growth rate. What does that mean? Well, it means what we hoped it would mean, and it's this level of outperformance. This, port, this chart here goes all the way back to 1999, but you can see this really rams home Brian's point about long holding periods, compound, the beauty of, of compounding, and really what that means relative to the wider indices. The, the, these two slides were so important for us um, in that it shows you not only the importance of the upward growth, it also shows you the dips on the way down. If I can just zoom in a little bit, had you been in the fund and gone through those horrible days post, post the tech bubble, you'd have had to have waited for the portfolio, the Poland fund to 3.3 uh, years for the portfolio to recover, which kind of feels like a long time, I guess. Uh, and it was at the time I was, I was there, but it took 6.1 years for the S&P 500 to recover. And it took 12.6 years for the Russell 1000 growth index to recover. That is an enormous amount of time. And as time goes on, by the time the, these, um, the indices had recovered, the Poland fund had continued to do incredibly well. And there you go, it speaks for itself. The reason why we, we like this is the totally dovetails in how we regard the world. But the other thing is I would say is that most of the other equity portfolios that we buy into have a very, very similar profile. This is exactly what we look for when we're buying into a fund. I don't know if there's anything on there, Alistair, you want to add? Or have I, have I covered all those little points there? No, nothing for me. No. Uh, James, I've probably got maybe one or one or two points to, to add to that. If I if I actually just share my screen, because there sure. was a question around about volatility and, and et cetera, et cetera. So let me just share. This is the, the long-term track record of the portfolio. So obviously, it's been going for over 30 years, but if we just focus on this very bottom line, because this kind of, I think, neatly encapsulates everything that Brian has been talking to. So this, this is an annualized uh, a set of data over 32 years. First of all is our performance. Annualized, we have delivered 15.6% return per annum for our clients, annualized over that particular time frame. And, and I want to link that back to exactly what Brian said about what, what are we trying to do? And that's really construct a portfolio of the best, 20 of the best companies out there that we can find. That's all we're trying to do. But on average, the portfolio should be growing at around 15% per annum on an earnings growth basis. And then we believe fundamentally that share price returns will follow that over the long term if you let these companies compound. And that's exactly what we've done. So the, the earnings growth has been around that 15%. The portfolio has delivered that 15%. That has been set against a beta of 0.86. You know, over the last 10 years, if you've had a beta of probably 1.3, you've been a hero because the markets have been going northwards. But you will find there are going to be some shocks along the way. We've achieved that excess return with a beta of 0.86. So, you know, well less than the market. Plus also what we're incredibly proud about is because of the quality of these businesses, we're able to protect aggressively on the downside. So, you know, when markets uh, turn negative, a measure of downside protection is how far you go down with the marketplace. So our downside capture is 65, which means when markets go down, we only capture about 65% of that downside. Conversely, we've also been able to capture on the upside. Clearly, when markets are going through exuberance, we maybe not capture the whole of the market, but we're pretty happy that over the long term, we're able to give our clients that protection, that, that almost sleep at night portfolio, but they know that they'll, they'll also participate 
when markets return healthy returns as well. So I just wanted to make that point. Hopefully, again, that that brings in that 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 risk side as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. OK, well, I think unless that's it, I don't see any other new questions. I'm just looking at my glamorous assistant to see if we've had anything added. I guess the one that maybe, Paul, you should maybe touch on. Um, I, I appreciate uh, a lot of uh, guys out there today watching and won't have come across Poland maybe until today. Um, can you just talk about the availability of the funds? Because I appreciate uh, being relatively new to the UK. Some of these aren't available on all the platforms quite yet. Um, yeah, can you just, just give, give uh, an idea of how, how we can access your funds? Yeah, exactly. So at the end of the day, um, we're very happy to try and make our fund available. The fund itself is a Dublin based USIT fund. Um, it, it, it's been now running for about eight or nine years, uh, but we've only recently really been very proactive in making sure it is available on certain platforms. So if there are platforms that you'd like us to have it on, we will work tirelessly to make sure that that is the case. But there are about, about seven or eight platforms that we are already on. But as I say, please let us know and we will, we will work tirelessly to make sure this fund is available to you. Fab, okay. Well, on that note, I reckon let's, oh, we have one question. We have one final question. Here you go, bear with me. Let me see if I can pick this up. Do we have a David, a question from David? Oh yes, just going back to the, the rankings. So I know the answer to that, but uh, it might not um, it might not be obvious. Uh, Whether the rankings on the previous slide there, Paul? Uh, can you just just talk through how many they're out of and what they what they are what they refer? Yeah. So this is the uh, the Investment Alliance Large Cap Growth Universe. So there's around about three hundred and fifty managers, and the rankings just means the percentile. So. Uh, uh, for the for the uh, returns, we are fourth percentile um, out of 100. So you can probably do the math quite quicker, uh, certainly more quickly than I can. Downside capture, we are ranked number one. Uh, it, the, the first the first percentile information ratio, the first percentile B to the first percentile. So again, it will rank you in terms of one being the best. Okay, fab. Hopefully that. That's clear. Any, anything more on that, David? Or for anybody else for that matter, feel free to get in touch. Send us an email. Uh, we'll do our best to get back to you. Uh, I can see also the question now about the note of which platforms the fund's available on. Uh, we will make that uh, clear um, at, at the end of the presentation. So with that, thank you so much for, for dialing in today, uh, for listening to us. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. hope this is the first of many. Uh, there will be CPD certificates available for those of you who want them. Please let me know and I'll get something back to you ASAP. Uh, since this is recorded, um, there will be another opportunity to dial in and watch this at your leisure again in the future, should you wish. But on that, I'm going to say thank you so much for, to Brian and for Paul for their time this afternoon. I uh, hope to see you guys very soon over in Boca Raton, if, we, if, we, hum, if that's humanly possible. Uh, otherwise, you're very welcome to come and join us here in Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, so with that, thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.